Good evening and welcome to Cafe Scientifique. Um, this is a wonderful crowd. It's so nice to see everybody turn out, even though we have some snow on the ground already in November. I think lots of people are happy about that. And, um, so, I am Brian Bachner, and I'm the director of Montana Inquiry. And so, Montana Inquiry is the program that is sponsoring this event this evening. And so, Inquiry is funded by the National Institutes of Health. And we are charged with building the research infrastructure and the workforce pipeline in Montana. And what we want to do is we want to fund and develop research that's done by Montanans for Montana. And a big part of science research is discourse. Scientists need to talk, and people need to talk, but we need to have talk that's not just between people in academics and people in industry. We need to have talk that goes throughout the community. I mean, everybody needs to be involved with these scientific discussions. And that's really the idea behind this event this evening, is to have an environment that is a semi-casual environment and have a scientific discussion among you. Okay, I'm going to try to talk a little bit louder. So, um, now, so the, the format for this evening is um, our guest speaker, Tomas Gideon, is going to give a presentation. We'd ask you to hold your questions during the presentation, but then we will take a short break after the presentation. Everybody can you know, stand up, stretch, refresh their drink, and then we will have a question and answer period, okay? And also during that little break, we'll have a raffle also. So don't lose your little raffle tickets, okay? So, I'm really excited to announce our invited speaker tonight. So, Dr. Gideon is a professor in the Mathematical Sciences Department at Montana State University. Um, he's a native of Slovakia, um, and he got his bachelor's degree from the University of Bratislava, okay, and then his PhD work he did at Georgia Tech Institute, and his research area as well as student were studying chaos in one-dimensional dynamical systems and cyclic feedback systems. And for those of you who don't know, chaos is actually a mathematical theory. It's not, <laughs> it's not just your son's will. <laughs> So, um, Tomas has, over the years, has accumulated nearly every award that MSU has for professors, both on the teaching side and the research side. And what you're going to see, he's an excellent speaker, and you know, he takes mathematics, and he doesn't make it simple, but what he does is he makes it so that you understand the importance of mathematics. I think mean, that's one of the inspiring things about listening to Tomas talk. Um, so, as I said, he's uh, given the Coprima lecture at MSU. He's been awarded the Cox Family Award for Research and Creative Scholarship. He was also MSU's Letters and Science Distinguished Professor, which is the highest honor that the college bestows on professors. And his research focus involved integrating mathematics with cell biology, neuroscience, and biochemistry. And also, he's a great mentor of students. So I think tonight we're going to hear about a few really fun topics. So. Thank you very much. I love these two mics. If there's somebody in the back who can kind of give me fingers, I'm going like this. Okay, so yeah, okay. Because I'm trying, I'm going to talk like this. The mic uh, goes away and I have to uh, adjust. So, so. To okay, so uh, again, this is a discussion session. I'm really glad to see a lot of people here. I was also very nervous about trying to uh, engage exactly the level of uh, what I'm going to talk about. So there'll be not much math. There'll be not that one math symbol in this lecture that worked very hard in achieving this. Okay? <laughs> uh, uh, but let me know if you have any you know, these questions at the end. But if you kind of play on explain something, you can stop me. I think you should stop. So wouldn't it be nice if we can predict some of these things? It's a problem which 
uh, you know, economy, weather, earthquake, cancer. And here's my one for Montana. Uh, everybody thought the U.S. won Super Bowl came out. It would be nice to know when this blows up or it doesn't come out. So these are things which are very complicated, but things which we like to know. Okay, they come from the economy, all disease, hurricanes. We had hurricanes uh, this year. Uh, we're not very clear where they go, when they go, how they go. Uh, diet. How many of you are uh, I'm not going to ask this question. I don't think about diet. <laughs> diet change from year to year, from five years to five years. Seems like we don't know how they affect people. Why? Why? What's, how do we know these things? How do we predict uh, these uh, uh, complicated things? Pandemics. Pandemics is something which you always are afraid of. They come from China, some kind of new virus, some kind of new bacteria which can wipe out the uh, civilization of 1918. Uh, again, how, it would be nice to know how to predict this when this happens and be ahead of this. this thing. So I'd like to uh, kind of talk about these complicated issues and how the scientists know some of these things, not all of them, some of them. So I'd like to uh, kind of start with a kind of categorization and tell you what we can or what we cannot do. So uh, these complex systems or complicated phenomena, I will uh, uh, kind of link on two different scales. From simple to complicated and I'll tell you what I think of what is simple, what is complicated later, and it's obviously uh, on how we hold it. Uh, from something which is unique to something which repeats quite often. Okay? So think about uh, something which is oops, simple and repeats. How many of you are gardeners? <laughs> there is a saying in both when you plant your garden in spring when snow from Bolivia goes away. <laughs> I hope that you know this, but that's the right time. So this is something which comes from observations, right? many, it happens many, many times. It's a simple thing, spring comes. Right? So you kind of get this uh, experience, experiential thing which you kind of know, right, is the truth. If you have something which is more complicated, uh, kind of it, uh, it's, but it's again repeated, something like, uh, uh, well, what's the effect of, uh, uh, I don't know, diet on a, a high blood pressure, of smoking on a high blood pressure, right? That's a very complicated, we are a very complicated system. And uh, we have no idea how this effect actually goes through your organism. But we have a lot of repetitions, right? All of us, as not a friend, and the people are, are repetitions of the experiment, so we can tease apart uh, somehow correlations, which things are probably related to which others. And many of the medical, uh, the devices we get. <coughs> so we can use statistics on complicated systems which repeat. But sometimes you have systems which don't repeat. Right? We, we, it's a complicated system and you do not have multiple observations. The climate will be one of them. Climate will change, it's changing on Earth, and it happens once. There's no other uh, kind of repetitions we can do and do statistics on this. And I will talk about that part of this rectangle, the quadrangle, uh, where the modeling takes place. Okay. What's the last piece? Unique and simple? Well, it's like uh, uh, in the morning I smell my coffee on myself. No science out there, right? It just happens. Uh, so, let me not concentrate more on the. Should we jump in? Let me concentrate on the right hand side of this, on the complicated part of. Uh, this equation uh, and see uh, how, what kind of phenomenon belongs there. So, from so unique to complicated, weather and hurricanes. Now, that's kind of halfway between. Okay? If it's something which repeats, weather repeats every day, uh, hurricanes repeat every year, there's probably 10 of them, right? But they're not always the same. They always, you cannot really, the, the weather is a little different, the conditions are different, the atmosphere is in a different state, uh, the winds are different. Uh, you know, there's little slight variation, so you can kind of use statistics on it, but not quite. We also have to understand the underlying causes of what, how things work and makes a kind of mathematical model. Um, these are kind of maps we see all the time, hard disease prevalence, right? You get the statistics, it's a complicated system, there's a lot of repetitions, cancer, economy. Again, economy happens every year, but there's a there's a drift, there's difference that changes from year to year to year. So it's not the same thing today as in 1968, clearly, or even 2000. So there's a repetition, but it also in some sense unique, so it's a mixed bag. 
There are some things which are definitely unique. Right? Earthquakes happen so rarely that you can't really do any statistical analysis of how they happen. Like if you do, that happens every 600,000 years. Uh, that's, there's nothing to this thing that you can do. And Yellowstone, volcano. Uh, climate, one at a time. So, in the top, I'm going to repeat things you can do statistics. But the bottom, what I would like to talk about, you need to do something else. You do all this. So, how do we predict these events which happens only once, the unique events? Sometimes we are unlucky. Okay, I hope there's no geologists in the house, but I don't think. <laughs> you can tell me if I'm correct, but there's not much known for the causes. We have some ideas of how things work underground, how the technologies work, and so forth. But that's not enough to have in-time prediction of Earthquake. Right? Or, we know Yellowstone moves up every 600,000 years. Why? We don't know. That's what happens last four times. But why it happens, I have no idea. Right? So this is unique events, but I don't think we can do this one with science. Other things, you know, we can try to do some scientific we can understand the causes and try to put them together in a way that we can actually predict the future. So this is the stuff which I'm going to talk about. Uh, many of these, the science is known. I see that you don't see it, so I'm trying to read everything, okay? The science is known, at least, you know, to a large extent, but these are complicated systems. And I want to focus on this particular part, because that's what we try to do, deal with complicated systems. And I'll try to explain in detail what I mean by complicated systems. So what are these complex, complicated systems? And I'll draw these kind of funny pictures with these dots and arrows. Actually, I should just go back. Okay. Um, so these dots can stand for an abstraction for any event or uh, phenomena or something like that which can happen. This could be, uh, you know, one of these dots could be uh, uh, the heart disease incidents. Right? And the other could be smoking. Right? Arrow if the smoking is that one of these things affect the other. So arrow is kind of this effect. Right? So there are many parts which affect complicated behaviors. It's not just a simple one explanation, there's many, many explanations. And then uh, there could be multiple different things which influence one particular outcome. Um, and we talk about feedback. I got feedback from the back. Um, so the feedback is a problem where I have two different uh, phenomena, and one affects the other, the other affects back the first one. It's very difficult to understand what will happen kind of in the long run. Here's the example which I'll come back in the climate uh, part of this talk, which will be short. Uh, where, you know, if you have more global warming, you get melting of the ice. So that's kind of one effect. But then the ice, as it melts, makes Earth more black or blue, right? Because the ice reflects the sunshine or sunlight. Uh, but if I have enough ocean and sea there, it absorbs heat. So that lack of ice now affects global warming. We absorb more heat. So global warming affects the ice, ice affects that. So these feedbacks, and you don't know where it ends, if this is a positive feedback or negative feedbacks. Uh, global warming is going to promote, at least in some places, growth of plants. Plants fix carbon. So global warming affects uh, carbon sequestration in a positive way. So if you get more carbon out, it should be good for global warming. Now you should balance all of these things so you can multiple feedbacks, and that's what you know, difficult is about. So these feedbacks make things complex. Indirect feedbacks are places where you affect you know, yourself through a loop of multiple intermediaries. And all of these, the systems have these kind of structures because they have to analyze uh, precisely. Okay? So, um, that was kind of the classification. So, I'm trying to go and talk about things which are unique, not repeated necessarily, and need to understand the essence of, of the problem of physics or causes to have some kind of a chance to, to predict the future, <laughs> but yet the system is complex. Well, we've been around this uh, for a while, right? So if you uh, think about our filmmakers, on the left is my tent to show you seasons. Right? So Earth has seasons, 
and we need to plant our gardens, our fields at the proper time because otherwise we'll not have food to eat. Now it's better than it used to be. Uh, but you can see these rhythms. Right? You see moon coming around. You can see celestial bodies uh, do some kind of very regular behavior. And so since time immemorial, we try to uh, explain and understand how this works. So, um, you know, the very question is can we understand this? Can we know when to plan? Can we know why things happen? This could be repeated stuff, like what happens in a month, but also one at a time, which is. Uh, eclipse or some comments coming through, what we buy, you know, this is kind of something that we want to do. So we try to, on this kind of side note here, explain to you how we came from that very primitive kind of like, oh, when Baldi uh, loses snow, we should plant the garden, to something where we actually do, do some mathematics and physics and can predict uh, real global uh, events. So I'll go briefly through these four guys, Galileo, uh, Aristotle Galilee, Descartes, and Newton. Uh, this part is from my friend who taught me this. He's a philosopher of science in Prague, and I was very impressed by this um, part. So he can try to tell you my explanation of what he told me. Um, so the question is how do we, expl how do we explain <coughs> motion? How do we understand how things move around us? Will we start some seasons? Uh, so the artist of one, you know, he has these four causes. He's a philosopher, you know, so I can kind of lie or I can be This is my explanation. Right? So there are four causes, and I'm trying to explain these four causes of a soccer ball. Okay? So a uh, soccer ball moves. Why the soccer ball moved? There, there's a material, material cause, which is the, the essence of that ball. It's built roundish, so because it's built from that material, it has capacity to roll or move. The formal cause is why, why things, uh, <clears throat> why we move. What's the formal structure of, of uh, relationships which make the ball move? Well, there's a soccer field, there's soccer teams, there's soccer tournaments. That's the kind of formal cause of this might be. Moving cause, the person who gets the ball. And there's a final cause, which is the, why is the structure too far? This is the goal of the object, right? which is a goal, scoring a goal. Um, so this is very different science than we're used to, right? First of all, I mean science, right? First of all, there is uh, an actor in this description. We don't have that. We don't talk about in science who kicked the ball, who is moving something around, right? So this is a very different kind of foreign concept of what science, what science is. Even, even Aristotle himself divided uh, the world between the heavenly uh, kind of realm and, and the earth realm. And he was saying, well, the science should really concern only about stuff which is out there, moons and stars and suns, because that's predictable. You can do something about it, you can describe that. What happens on earth is too unpredictable. Because you have people who kick the ball. I'm going to describe it scientifically, I can't. And this kind of hang out for a very long time. Galileo, a long time later, uh, was the first who tried to introduce mathematics into the description of things, uh, into phenomena. So let me try to explain this. We can, we can touch a hot stove and get, get really sense that's hot. We can also see if something is shorter or long, you can see the length. It's very difficult to measure directly acceleration. Right? How much does this accelerate? That's how do I have to measure acceleration? So he was the first who said, oh, here's how I'm going to measure this. I take an uh, uh, inclined plane and roll the ball down. And measure of how far the ball goes in the first second, second second, and the third second. This is, by the way, the first time people actually have clocks. The clocks before were not very precise, so we actually could do that. Um, and what you see, you roll this ball, in the first second it goes this far, say two feet. In a second, one foot, one foot. Second, second, it goes for four. Third, it goes nine. And they go, oh, if I change the angle of this, what changes? Nothing. It goes, it changes, it goes in the store, so in the first second it doesn't go one, it goes in the half. 
and the second second it goes four times to the first half, and then in the third second it goes in nine times for the first you know, one, two, or three seconds. Uh, so he converted acceleration to measuring of the distance. If you look at any thermometer on your window, you're converting measurement of temperature to distance, or for the bar goes up and down. All our measurements are basically changing some physics into measurements of distance. So it was the first time where you can actually measure a method of expressed I think expressed things which are not directly, you know, you cannot directly experience. Uh, one of the funny stories was that he developed also the first uh, telescope, and he went and saw the first time the, the rings of the Saturn. When he told him, all the other scientists, they believed him. But they said, why would you do that? I mean, why would you look, I mean, this is like a magic. You look through a window, that's not the reality. You're looking through some stupid glass. Okay, what's that? That's, you can go on the, on the market on Saturday and with all other uh, people who are trying to sell you, tell you some trinkets, that's not, that's not science. Science is something that you can see. You're changing the world by looking through the window. The little glass. So it was a it was a cultural shift to accept that you can actually see through telescopes the reality. It's not something else. It is actually the reality which you can see. So these microscopes, all the machines, we all do this. But that's what it was the first time I was. Um, he didn't look at causes of motion. He described how motion goes. He described how the motion, how the ball falls down. How, you know, but he was never talking about why the ball falls. He just does. Right? There's no gravity in this theory. There's no <laughs> causal and there's no interaction. Interaction happens first time when Descartes came around. This was, he was, he was uh, overlapping you now, else at the same time we were um, He was first time thinking about collisions of objects. What happens if, if I have one object move and they crash? What happens? Will they, uh, the left will make a right. What is he, what is, what is he, who's deciding that? And he came up with this, his theory was really wrong, by the way. It doesn't work. Right? <laughs> uh, he said, if I have a bigger body, you just take the other one and move with it. No matter, there's no bouncing in this theory. It's completely wrong. Um, and, uh, he, you know, he was kind of, he, he was not somebody who was doing experiments. He was saying, you observe phenomena, you're a scientist, when you take the phenomena, go home and think about it. And then by thinking, you go and understand the causes and the underlying structures. That's it. There's no way to, to go back and to experiment and verify it or something. But just, that's what you do. You just figure out what's behind the wall by thinking. Done. Uh, so, Newton will change that and I'll talk about it next slide. So the, uh, the, the, the breakthrough here is that he realized that if I look at uh, motion, for instance, it doesn't matter if it's blue object or green object, or it's uh, soft or hard, or big or triangular. What matters is it's got the amount of motion. Right? This is momentum. So it's only part, some parts, some attributes which decide the outcome of, of so this interaction. Right? That allows you to abstract from the world, all those quantities into a kind of imaginary modeling world, this state of the system. So the state of the system is a place which is not the real world, but it's a world which only contains those attributes which are relevant. So that's what we'll keep from that. And then Newton came around, and uh, the difficulty with celestial bodies, which Newton saw for the first time, is that, you know, uh, these bodies, they affect each other, right? and that, that effect changes every single second. Right? If you, these guys are far apart, which you want to switch some other ones on here. Um, the position, how far these objects are, objects are from each other, you know, determine the force, how much, how much they actually affect each other. So there's a position that affects the force, but it's uh, the force then in turn affects how these things go around. So there is a different, there is a kind of feedback going back. And the question is how do I how do I do this? How do I account for these balls 
when they constantly change positions, the force that changes, when force that changes, they change position. How do I, how do I get this down? How do I compute all of this? There's no, uh, there's no pause on the things that we kind of stop to allow me to compute. Well, the answer is, oops. <coughs> They do mathematics. So he developed differential equations. You may have heard this word, you know, all the many of you do because that's one of differential equations as a way to describe this kind of continuous change of all the variables. And then calculus to be able to solve that. So from that point on, uh, here is the kind of science as we do it today. This is kind of abstraction of what he has done. But we go around and postulate two things. We postulate causes. What causes, how these things go on, how these bodies talk to each other. What is the interaction between them, which we call forces sometimes. And then extract from the world these kind of initial data. You know, what is the state of the system right now? And by the state of the system, I mean moon position, earth position, sun position, and a satellite. What is it right now? And then I know how the forces react between them. Once I, that's my kind of homework, so I'm done with that, that's good. Then I can use differential equations and calculus to compute how the system is going to evolve. Right? So compute, I would say measurable phenomenological outcomes just means something which I can measure. Because forces, by the way, you cannot measure. If you ever measure forces, or there's a physicist that should be careful. Um, <laughs> you can measure the effect of the force. Right? The force is like this excellent, it's not kind of, you can touch it, it's like an abstract thing, cause, which Newton kind of postulated as they would exist. And he had troubles with this. I had troubles with this in high school as well, right? Because you go on and say, oh, so Earth and Moon have some force between them. Now Moon, Moon moves, and immediately the force changes. Who talked to from Moon? Who would pick up a phone and call Earth and say, oh, by the way, the force has not changed immediately, right now. Right? How do you act on distance? How do you act, how does sun and moon, you know, there's a speed of light right now, right? So how do you change the force immediately if these things are so far apart? So he and everybody else around in that one felt there must be some medium which, which mediates that force. Right? I can understand, I do this, right? I can push this away. So if I do that, I say, hey, the moon is away. He doesn't. Oh, hey, he doesn't. Maybe I have some real force. Star Wars force. Uh, right, so you know, some kind of abstraction, but you put it in, you assume that happens, then you compute how things, what things are going to be next, next day, and then you measure. And you say, is it there? And if it's not, maybe I toss in my, my causes, my forces differently, maybe I should adjust my model. And you repeat this process again and again. You don't have to do this with physics and with uh, celestial bodies, you can do this with any other area. So, this is what we do in science, basically. And we do this in kind of this abstract space or state space where we only abstract things we have. Alright. So, from Newton, so not only the phenomena, but also the causes and effects and ontology, the things which cause things which are behind a lot of things. Uh, so, again, predictive models are predicting the future state based on current state and the interaction. <coughs> so this is how we got from the ancients to today. So let me try and talk about briefly about these things which I advocated in the Chibrachi. Um, so we all hopefully saw solar eclipse this summer, <laughs> pretty amazing. Um, so how do we compose this? I was in Idaho, and this day, 11.32, the solar eclipse came. And it came, 11.32. That was very impressive. Um, let's see, so we're just kind of going through this kind of, um, outline of how things are computed. So we do know, we can measure with great precision, velocity and position of celestial objects. Uh, Earth, all the sun, all these places. So check, that's the initial condition in some sense. And then we know the Newton's law, or you know, the 
General Rodrigo, whatever you want to compete with, uh, which are the causes. So both of those are easily accessible. And so you can run your differential equations, your uh, compute position at every future time. So if you compute a position, like it's on the bottom picture, we have moon blocking the sun, you compute exactly where on Earth you can see it at what time you can see the universe. So in some sense, this is an easy problem. It has been a long, long time a very difficult problem, but compared to the other problems we'll talk about, this is not difficult. There's only three bodies, essentially, and everything is known and computable done. The more complicated problems are these. Okay? So the weather forecast and hurricanes is kind of the same issue. Um, and we know the science. The science is mostly the science of heat, evaporation, uh, motion of fluid, both the ocean and the, and the air around it, how heat, how it heats up the atmosphere. All this stuff is kind of known. The problem is uh, with the initial state. Right? We need to have the initial state and the interactions. The interactions we kind of know. What's the initial state? Well, the initial state for, say, hurricanes would be, well, you know, temperature, cloud covering, moisture, pressure of atmosphere and the ocean, perhaps uh, maybe 5,000 miles square, where it comes between Africa and South America. Now not like approximately every single point at some time at noon of uh, September first. That's difficult. That's difficult because we don't have a capability of measuring it at, in, you know in those kind of all those different points and those values. We can say well it doesn't matter if you just measure it at five points or six points it should be fine. The problem is that these complex systems, which are large and interactive, like uh, the weather system, the small changes in initial state can lead to huge variations later on. So if you go and measure west of us, temperature, wind, all these kind of variables, which will allow to predict the weather in Bozeman tomorrow or for next week, uh, if I know everything to the book dot, I should probably be able to compute the forecast for the next two or three or five weeks. The problem is we put a few more you know, weather balloons out and measure it in every hundred miles in three or four spots. That's the data we have as an initial condition. But there's a lot of variation which we don't measure and we don't know the other stuff. And that other stuff can decide whether in six days it will snow or be 65 degrees here or 55. And so if you notice, you combine this kind of modeling and approximate initial condition with a lot of statistics. Uh, of the previous, what happened in previous settings, and you kind of get a forecast for five days. That's why we have forecast for five days. If you want to go to seven, you'll be very wrong, probably, <coughs> most of the time, for six and seven. If you spend billions of dollars for more satellites, you can get slightly more precision, but maybe you can extend it by two days for four. It's not worth the money. Right? So basically, this is where we are. With it's a complex system, we understand the physics, it's very difficult to, to nail down the actual Climate, again, yeah, this is my idea, right? Climate. Climate is a system with a lot of feedbacks. I mentioned some of these feedbacks before. Right? You have this, uh, the climate influences growth patterns of plants, which changes how much CO2 is being uh, put into the plants and sequestered, which may, again, influence how much you know, the climate change progresses. That's a negative feedback. Right? Things get better. Uh, but you can also have the melting of the ice. Right? Absorbs now the Earth absorbs more heat, and here's the result of that. Uh, which I got by internet, which is basically telling you this is the winter ice on the North Northern Ocean, uh, which uh, dramatically shrunk over the last 22 years. Right? This is a summer extent of the uh, North 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 Arctic Ocean. So you can see that there's a lot, lot, lot more reflection of heat over here and over here, so there could be a positive feedback which makes a uh, situation worse. <coughs> but what we could do, this is kind of model which again got off the internet, this is kind of what you can compute right, with your model and stuff. This is a simulation of uh, CO2, uh, carbon dioxide how it works around the world. Okay, this is a big fluid tank, the whole earth. Yeah, here's how the CO2 is propagating around the world and, and changing. This is based on satellites and models. Uh, 
the brain is like in a lot of CO2, it's in the hemisphere, blue is kind of under, uh, uh, below the average of CO2. Uh, this is what we know. Some of them, we can compute some of these things, and we kind of know the science. We're not quite all of it, probably, but we know the majority of the science. Again, the problem becomes the initial condition and the resolution. These current models are looking at, you know, we talk about state space. They chop the Earth to like 100 mile or 500 mile squares, and then for each square, they assign certain variables. How much the Earth is reflecting the sunlight? How much. Uh, water comes out, how much uh, absorption of CO2 gives, which depends on how much forest in there is, how much land, how much you know, different uh, uh, plane covers. That's very approximate. There are 500 kilometers square, square on Earth. That's one number, or five numbers. Right? So, and you do this, these big models, there's a lot of kind of precision based on that scale. And, and again, computers are not so big, so big. But what we can do, is to do many simulations with different assumptions, which are very close to it, different assumption, different initial states, slightly different. They're all consistent with our measurements, but we change a little bit in the places where we cannot measure. Uh, we like different scenarios in terms of how strong the feedbacks are between which we mentioned before. And then what you get out is different predictions. These are all different models, which are slightly different assumptions, slightly different predictions, and you get kind of a band of possibilities. And then you can kind of tell you, you can say uh, or uh, conclude what are the best scenarios, the worst scenarios, or the average scenarios. It's not the best thing to do. Right? It doesn't mean that science doesn't do its job. Uh, it is just because the system is very complex. It is very difficult to measure initial data. And we do the best we can. And we cannot say this is what will happen because that will be false. So we can kind of tell you approximately what will happen. So that's kind of how, how we can do something about um, the climate change. Now let me talk about briefly about what I do, and I'll be finishing in a few minutes, and we'll, we'll do questions afterwards. I'm using this kind of a, a <coughs> paradigm of modeling in molecular biology. Not physics, not celestial bodies, but cells. So, um, where is that coming from? Well, the genes in each cells produce proteins. These proteins they go and try and, um, this is very rough, what you see. And they um, control maybe some other genes. So the feedback is all over the place. Genes talk to other genes, proteins go to other proteins. Uh, they all talk to the environment around. Uh, cells, cells talk to each other. Our immune cells talk to uh, our cells in our guts, in our microbiome. Uh, and there's a lot of information about the fact that actually what do we have in our guts may affect our brain in development and even when we are adults. We're just trying to figure this out. A lot of feedbacks going back to the complex systems. One affect the other, the other affect the first. So we can write down these models very similar to the ones in physics uh, to try to understand the whole system. This is what we deal with sometimes. So for biology, it will give you uh, these kind of networks. Each of these little nodes is a, is a gene or a protein, and they tell you, these guys talk to each other. Tell me what this whole thing does. Uh, we call this a hairball. Uh, <laughs> we can't do much with this, this is too complicated. Right? We'd like to know if I can turn one of these things in the corner and make it double of the previous one. How would this change will reverberate through the network? Right? It's not a network of sprints, it's more complicated. How things affect each other has to be gleaned from experiments. But this is something where uh, if things go wrong, if these things communicate badly between the cells or within the cells, you end up with allergies. Like this is the neural cells not knowing which one is mean and which one is a foreign agent. Immune disease is cancer. All of these are problems of communication between the cells in these networks. It's very crucial we try to understand how these things work. Um, I may end up in, with malaria because I was advertised in <laughs> So, <laughs> malaria is a very serious disease. We are lucky that we're now living around the uh, equator where this is really a big uh, 
200 million cases a year, that's a lot of diseases, a lot of death, death, death as well. Eventually, I want to go through this uh, very complicated um, diagram which describes how the, uh, the parasite enters the humans and what it does to, does to them. I can, I'm very happy to talk about it in the discussion. But now what I'd like to talk about is one particular part of this life cycle, which is the, uh, the time when the parasite spins in the red blood cells in the blood. And so it goes, mosquitoes bite you, there's a bite you, comes in, goes into a river, hangs out for a while, goes outside, and goes into your red blood cells, comes into your red blood cells and multiplies in your red blood cells for about 48 hours. <coughs> Actually, pretty much exactly 48 hours. And then, all these hundreds of thousands of cells, red blood cells in your body, burst at the same time. They go like, boom. And it, they burst within, you know, maybe 15, maybe 30 minutes. So they go, 15 hours, they go, boom. They all burst. And they all infect the other red blood cells, fresh ones. Uh, you get a bit big fever at that point. So if you know malaria, you get these huge spikes of fever, which are periodic because of this, because your immune system goes crazy, but suddenly there's all these bugs around that try to kill it. Um, second, if you have serious malaria, you get uh, anemia, because the red blood cells are being attacked. The big question which we had were, how does the parasite keep the clock? It's not really small, you know, small watches they wear on their arms, right? How do they know if they have 48 hours they have to get out? And if you know something about biology, it's a very noisy system. So things kind of disinclined, they're not kind of very good at keeping rhythms very well. Right? So it's not like randomly this can happen. Um, and so the question is, how is the rhythm being kept? Uh, a second, can we disrupt it? Because if we can figure out what keeps the, the clock and we can go in, uh, we and his biologists and all, right? And we're gonna knock this thing out, and now these guys will start coming popping up every now and then. The immune system can take care of it. It will definitely disrupt uh, the very, very seriously. And this is not antibiotics, this is not something which you can get immunity for, so this will be a very good way to try to do something. So this is a data which nobody actually saw so far. So this is the data which actually we got from uh, patients from Thailand. And uh, in a very complicated way how this is done. Uh, you cannot take uh, blood from people uh, who are sick every three hours. That's very unethical. Uh, so if you take the, the blood from people and they put it in a dish and they grow it for four hours in a dish. It's called ex vivo experience. So let me to see what you see here. Okay, so each, uh, okay. each line, so in the bottom you have a parasite on top of the human genes. Some human genes. Human has 26,000 genes. So this is a small fraction of them. Yellow means high, blue means low. And on the bottom we have a, this is a 48 hour cycle. This is 48 hours. Each column is three hours. The first column is three hours, second is six hours. 9 hours, 12 hours, and so forth. Right? Each is one gene. So that this wave which you see on the bottom is really a wave of problem, wave of expression. So there's some genes which peak early in 3 hours. And then the next gene, next of genes peaks in 6 hours. The first genes go away. So this is kind of going like a big wave. And the second wave comes in, the third wave comes up. It's like a, it's like a wave of propagation in the back. And almost every gene in the, in the parasite is periodic. <coughs> the second one is human genes. Humans also have rhythms. I mean, you know that if you uh, fly to Europe, you get pretty groggy for a while. But you have circadian rhythm in silence. If you wake up in the morning, you get hungry. If it's not going at night, you get sleepy. That's all done because we have internal clocks. And so there's, a, there's some of these clock genes which you see on top. You don't see them as well, but there's definitely yellow bands <coughs> of the expression. And the big questions we have is, uh, you definitely see periodicity here. So these things are clocking. These things have a clock. Now the question is, does this uh, parasite listen to humans? For, right? It could be just having a own clock and not really worry about humans. Or it could kind of say, let me, let me look at this human clock and try to adjust myself to humans uh, so that I can I know what I can do. Um, and then finally, what genes in this this <coughs> are the ones which actually maintain the rhythm, which are just listening to these clock genes and pop out every now and then. 
which are the kind of Christmas lights at the end of the tunnel, and which are actually the real one drivers. Because if you know the drivers, so a lot of math, three years of work. Here's really this come on kind of current uh, idea. So this is another set of data from uh, the area on the left and the right. This our idea of 13 of these lines which we picked out. It says these are this is how these two talk to each other. And I think this is the core oscillator which actually drives the Binax computer this year. Now we have no idea if this is true, right? Because we just did some math magic on this for a couple of years. And what is now what we have to do is to try to see if this math magic works on systems of the East, which we know the answer, so we can verify that this works. And eventually we like to get we know we, we know somebody who can do the experiments, but they're expensive, so we don't want to try them before uh, before we know we do the kind of work. So here's kind of stuff which we do with these models. Um, okay, my last slide. So what, we talk, what, what I talked about here was we all need to predict future for complex systems. And there are of two kinds. There are statistical methods which can be used where we have a past and a record of these complex systems. And then mathematical ideas are kind of the only ones which can be used if, if the unique, um, unique thing is uh, which never repeated. But then you have to understand the causes and um, the, the science behind that. Right? And so even if I know those causes and systems are complex, you run into trouble sometimes because the systems are too complicated and there is very difficult to find initial conditions. It's very difficult to do these, do these simulations or experiments so you can the conclusions of your own complex systems. This is where we are currently, and I'm very happy to do that. Uh, I guess now we right? Is that right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much bigger and much smaller and more or less. There's not you know, like a main 
size may be the same, but this event which will be bigger than before. If I look around the world, you see uh, you know, hurricanes uh, which we had this year, there were like three in a row in the picture. Um, that has not happened before, right? The, the, size, is, the size of the, they had a hurricane on the island a couple of weeks ago. Right? I don't think it happened. They just, the blue sky strong has never happened in that area, right? So it's not, it's not like this will happen every year, but when things happen, it kind of happens much more broadly and more, right? If it rains, it rains much more. If it, it's going to be dry, it'll be much drier. So when the events happen, we'll be able more available. And that prediction is seen to be kind of being better food, right? So uh, the assumptions they're making that, you know, I can believe in science in terms of these people are trying their best to do this. There's no conspiracy or no, you know, people are trying to fool somebody else. And as uh, I know the process in the sense that if you make a mistake, there was somebody out there who's going to put in mistakes very happily to you and do something else, right? So this is how the science works. So if there is so many people working on this, uh, the consensus is usually correct. That's the combined my book them and my choice is. I cannot check the assumptions individually, but that's fine. Questions, comments? Yes. Say again? What's a Hamiltonian? What's a Hamiltonian? It's an interesting question from uh, from Greg Wheaton here. <laughs> What is a Hamiltonian? So, uh, Hamilton is a uh, energy formula for uh, studying a closed system so from a multi body system. <laughs> Does it help? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you know, if I have a, if I have a two, so two body system, I like move the body system. And uh, you can compute from such a system something sort of potential energy. And if I stop, then how how will how will they come, come to the I mean, potential energy if there's another drop this, but there's a certain energy which is embodied in this height because if I drop it, it will slam down to earth with a certain power with the velocity. Right? That's a potential energy. Um, kinetic energy is something where you energy when you have a car that moves fast and drops it in the wall. There's a lot of energy in that. Uh, velocity and that speed, right? So those two of those, you can have any kind of bodies to add those two energies, that's like a total energy of that body. Because you can take, if something goes fast, you can exchange, and if you throw something up, it has a lot of kinetic energy, but it kind of stops. So you can change that, that motion energy into rotation energy, you can change that to the total energy is constant. <laughs> I have to talk to Blake. <laughs> so, you talk about making these predictions. We know the cost, it's the science, but we don't have enough data for the initial stage of predictions are wrong, right? The cost. And, or we, we have errors, we can't go past five days in a while. But now, if we go back a couple hundred years, they thought they knew the underlying causes too. Maybe they didn't go for religious, celestial events, whatever. But they knew the causes and they had the same excuse. So are we being arrogant that we really know the science that well? If we reach the end stage, or are we not as good as we think we are? So are you asking where Ed, I'm arrogant to say? <laughs> no. I think so. so uh, right, yes and no. I said, in the climate, right? I think we know the main feedbacks. Right? There's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that we do not know. Right? I mean, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's kind of a whole, a whole planet wide way of things. But how uh, the change in, uh, you know, you, you, you have global no warming that will bring more dryness. Things and something will dry out. How will that affect the growth of uh, plants and such? Uh, how much CO2? Oh, this is just, it's very complicated, right? So we understand maybe how individual these things work, but when you put it into this huge network of interconnected pieces, that's where difficulties happen. Right? 
right? So, um, you know, what do you mean if I look at the genome? You, you might say, okay, if I perturb this one, this one will go up and down. Right? So I know that inch. But what happens if I put it in the head? Right? Suddenly I don't know things. So I, I, I don't know whether. I'm guessing we, there's not very surprising new science in terms of like, we have get new forces, we get new, completely new things on the kind of macro scale coming up. But it is just the way things to know. That's me. So, about 30 years back of the world because we were an embargo on all the chemical chemicals and stuff, right? Uh, genetics did not exist. So basically it was either math or we were doing something in right? math you can do with a piece of paper and you don't need anything you need any equipment, right? So you can do that. So theoretical physics and math was kind of what people went to and I do I would say both sides. Um, but I always retain that interesting kind of life sciences. Uh, so I do, you know, if there's math, mathematics is a field on its own, which are very difficult problems, which are uh, with the kind of power is measured in terms of how difficult problem you can kind of go through actually. And that's very valid stuff. Right? Uh, I, I like to learn things. I, I'm fascinated by biology. I think it's really interesting. And but the last 20 years, when we all the genome, it's just completely mind blowing which we will keep around. Uh, and so, if I can be in the room where people discuss this cool stuff and actually contribute, that's really interesting. Right? So, I'm, in some sense, I'm more a biologist by nature than now. Right? Uh, and a mathematician by training, so I actually have tools which can be used. Uh, but I think it's, it's not. I don't know if I, I think it's individual choice. I, I would not know if I want to force anybody to do this. Right? Who's, 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 who's. Ooh. One, two, three, four. Okay, go back. Um, so, the general here, there's been a lot of history, and I should have put you in that area with my ability to predict blood around five days. My question is how on earth you came to be? So, I'm going to get disappointed that we don't go out in five days. So you first kind of just how many centuries is it until humanity goes from the paradigm of prediction to something like in Star Trek where we can control the weather? How far is that? Really? <laughs> <laughs> so, so in the weather, I mean, so to me, oh, the question is, uh, so. Uh, how far we are from a situation where we can not just, well, now we can predict really weather for five years, right? But can we get to a place where we can control the weather? 
confidence that no good on the prediction will actually do it. Um, so I think it is, right, so you have to have leverage. Right? So when we talk about malaria, one thing is to understand it, and then you have to have tools to actually tweak it. And if Blake did not leave, he has the tools to do whatever he wants to do. Right? He, he knows how to do operate the CRISPR CAT system, which is last three years, it's revolutionizing what you can do with uh, how you can uh, very precisely target specific genes and for perturbations. Okay? So that's the tools we have in, in there. I don't see at this point any tools for how we can do the weather. Right? So if you have a tool to affect them, and then if you're understanding it's very quickly, you can go from uh, understanding and prediction to control. Um, finally, you can, we, if you want, if you have a hundred billion dollars, we can get the weather forecast for nine days. <laughs> so there's any principles in which you know which are and you just you know, simplifying the world, right? But if you have more data, initial data on humans, you get better forecast. Mm -hmm. Now there's a diminishing return because of this kind of butterfly effect. Things you have to make really, really precise, and you get you gain a little bit at the, at the end, right? So you have to get put a lot of money into it to get one day, a lot more money to get another day. Right? So, so at some point we'll say, well, I don't care. But actually, engineers, uh, engineers are thinking about how to change the climate. For instance, if you're going to have global warming, it's going to get really bad, well, and we can't control our carbon dioxide. Well, maybe we can explode an atomic bomb. We can little aluminum particles to reflect heat, things like that. I don't know anything about that, but people have spent a lot of time thinking about these things. How to actually control the climate. And that's frightening, but um, it is, that it's out there. Russ. <laughs> but even if we have exact measurements of the way the weather is right now, down to the last infinitesimal, and our science is exact, we still can't predict very Future because the system is chaotic, right? Yeah. I mean, once you have, I mean, if you have. Uh, exact initial yeah. conditions do not, we still have to do approximate numerical solutions and blah blah blah. True. Chaos. <laughs> Remember your beginnings. True. But, I mean, <laughs> that, that's only a question of getting bigger computers to make better, make better approximation. How about that? It's much easier. How about that prediction? I mean, if, you, if it already happened, you have a good model, maybe you could predict the little ice age and the medieval warm period. I never hear people trying to do that. Mm -hmm. That's all the question. Uh, that's too far back. Is it? These models are kind of like taking initial data from, you know, uh, well, 30 years, 40 years back. But they're predicting the water ice in the future. Right? Well, you can run them all forward, but again, as you go forward, you're going to lose. So uh, can't, you can't run these models back uh, you should be able to. Yeah, thank you. Doesn't mean you're more. I'm not sure how. Well, the question is why, uh, why we are not, you can probably go and try to test the models of, uh, of the climate going backwards. They don't go backwards. They have done this post picture. They can run and actually show the variation of the variation. So you can run it probably. So I think what you're saying is that. So, so this. This is a horrible PD you can run the backwards. I think that's why. Yeah. 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 But they don't they don't tell us about it because it must not work. Let me let me we go between the chemistry and physics here. <laughs> so the the post fiction is I think what I'm assuming is that you can go back to the sixties. Start a model from 60s, go forward to 70s and 80s, and see what they predict correctly. 80s and 80s. And then you can do the And then you can do the parameters and things so they actually does work. And then you can start with 2000s and go forward. They do that. They do that. That's, that's not a conservation model. Uh, the purple equations cannot run backwards because the fusion is not backwards. You cannot. It's something which. Tell us about what else besides malaria that you're working on. Actually, part of the uh, dark one, dark one is the defense uh, program, which uh, is synthetic bound. 
So grid biology is something where they try to uh, build you know, little small, I would say, large clickets. Okay, so think about this wall term, here's what they call uh, insulin pumps. What if you can take, you can tweak some genes in a way that we can implant that in your uh, habits of life habits, right? in, your, in your genes, in your cells, which can sense when your blood sugar goes down and poke the cells which make insulin go, hey, now we have do, do insulin, just do, do that little small in between, between sensing and poking. They don't do anything, they just, just repair and fix the organs. So you have to figure out how to make that sensing mechanism, how to make basically a transistor. Right? We, we know how to build electrical devices because we have these really nice pieces, transistors, we can put together in all different ways and build you know, TVs and radios out of it. The key is to have something which functions, you have two inputs, or one output, or three inputs, and two outputs, and it works always the same. So trying to build these things from genes. Wouldn't the pharmaceutical companies try and buy you off before you could do it? <laughs> they don't think this is possible. Not, not the pharmaceutical companies. So what I just described is a 20 years out at least. They, that's too far. They don't invest in this. Nobody invests in long-term behavior except you know, long-term stuff except for the government. Uh, so what's who's investing in the long term? You said, but we didn't hear. Uh, so. He said the federal government, but not right now. <laughs> 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 that's how it actually works. Um, why is Darbot interested in this? Right, this is, there's multiple reasons. Uh, but this doesn't work. So these people, they design very nice uh, these kind of circuits, almost like an like electrical circuit built from genes. They put them in cells, they put them in three different, different labs across the country, and they don't quite work the same way. I don't know why. Is it because the knowledge is not that right? Or because people are doing experiments differently. So they try to figure out uh, where the issue is, and they need models to predict when these things are uh, Again, this is, we're not building anything like that. Uh, we're building things where, well, don't be, but people have guesses. Um, just trying to do reproducible parts, which you can build in a cell phone and kind of put them together. So, um, that's one of the things we're trying to work on. Um, um, so we have a collaborative thing which works on this, which we know quite well, so we can use this technology to test it. Um, there's a group of campus, which is also a different list, um, which is actually fitted you know, for some people, for infection. So we're trying to figure out how uh, the cell sample works there. So those two projects. Yes? So, in high school and undergraduate education, I think we do a pretty good job with Newtonian mechanics. We sometimes do a little bit of statistics and we do very little mathematical modeling. The types of problems that you're looking at, do you see a shift in priorities for education that you're addressing? Um, so, we do the function of You know, each, each engineer and physicist and scientist, we all know should be a chemist. <laughs> That's as little as possible. <laughs> you know, differential equation of the language, right, which, which is kind of useful for this kind of stuff. I mean, statistical modeling is also good modeling. Statistics is not, you know, data science. There's a lot of stuff is shifting now towards um, trying to uh, understand and manipulate big data and huge data sets. Um, I, I think there will be, I heard some discussion about medical schools, prerequisites. The medical schools, you know, I think they're in the future, you know, the, the, the medical professionals will have to understand, um, and really understand kind of the outcomes of problems. Because you come with the problems and say, well, oh, there's 20% chance of this theory of class, but you can change this assumption with this. You need to understand what does that mean for a patient. You don't need to understand the guts of how this thing is working, but you can have to understand the real big picture of what is possible, what is feasible, how many things are. So that could be on the horizon, more quantitative um, education for the medical field. Uh, but that's kind of So on one of your last slides, you had like uh, expression of genes over time, and you had an era, and then this after a genes expression was automatic. So I guess. My question is, how much, or 
See those, that there's a PL times GTK plus and then plus DSGRN. Those are three different methodologies uh, which you're looking for, this, right? And some of them are, some of them are believing really well, and some of them are really ad hoc. So this is the, the first two are trying to uh, classify uh, these genes as, you know, based on kind of like experimental units and other systems, with things which are usually clock genes, or uh, have a much stronger periods, uh, certain features which you can statistically test. And we can also test it on mouse data for CPU and looking for uh, multiple data sets and improve on the main the genes which you know that correct. So you just apply it here. So then you get them a list of genes which are likely on, to come on the top. Then you're kind of trying to figure out which edge, which node can, can force the other one by assuming some differential equations that kind of you know, affect. And again, you see through all the combinations to find the best ones. Then you build some networks, you test the dynamics of those networks using the stuff which we developed uh, to see through a space of networks, different networks, which one is the best one, which one produces uh, the periods the most robustly. So there's a lot of stuff in that, okay? Uh, and there's many things which uh, are not like proved mathematically, which I would just hundred percent believe. Some are kind of like from experience, from biology, and so that's why I'm not 100% confident in the right thing. Because there's a lot of assumptions which were done in a way to, to get reasonable, but maybe not a good That's really interesting. Good question. See, I have my students here as well, you know, so <laughs> my clients. That's all, which is great. <laughs> Any other questions? There are some questions we have. So, this idea of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. This is a professional philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, uh, right, this is sensitive dependence on initial condition, which is the chaos, which we kind of touched on, but didn't talk about it much, so I can talk about it a little more. Uh, is that a mathematical phenomenon, or is this something which world is built? Why is the world built this way? Or is it built this way? Is it something which world really is like that? Is genes like that? Whether it's like that? Is it, or is it just our imagination because we made a model that way. That's the question. As always, it's a very difficult question. So why so we can what's this transmission condition? it's this idea of the rest mentioned as well, that if you you start with few you start with few uh, you can write like this few made by situations. Um, uh, you you know you have similar similar condition data. As you, that system progresses more and more, those trajectories of the future are diverging vastly apart. They can they, they go and they, they go so weather like you have the same weather today, but if you just change uh, a little bit of a uh, little hot cell on top of the bridge of ball, a little bit colder weather down the big sky, maybe that will have enough effect that five years down the road uh, you get completely different forecasts. So small changes that cause big differences. Um, so my view is that complex systems are like that. If you have a complicated system, that's what is the uh, kind of default state. But if I have genetics or genetic systems, which seem to operate with great repeatability and great kind of robustness to the system, so they, and if you if you look at a cell, or a special cell, they look like they have different levels of things, they seem to all be all over the place, but it's still doing the same function. The view in the, in the community is that that must be, uh, there must be some features on that system which have all, which guarantee that, because normally, randomly, you will not see that. 
the system is too complex and it's complex, it should behave very, very, very unpredictably. Um, but some systems don't. But they're struggling to learn from my data. That's kind of what So I think the world is like, for complex systems, it's very difficult to predict. Outside, it's good enough to predict that you're using a microphone and you have a computer phone. There's lots of successes. It just gives us more variables and more numbers. It's becomes harder. Yeah, you have to work on it. Right? Yeah. So of course, you have to design very carefully your transistors and things, which are robust to the heat and to this and that. Because if you don't, uh, it's a lot. So. Uh, Matches is the more, there's more variability. Kind of um, and, uh, other questions? Yes? No, uh, following up on that, I just want to point out my hero, Richard Feynman, pointed out that when you have large numbers of components, statistically, actually, you should expect them to behave in that combination. What's really amazing is the laws of physics are so simple. But the complex systems should be simpler still. At least according to the We should be simpler. That's what he said. Statistics, after all. Well, well it's also simple, right? So if you want to know, right? So if I if I just think a uh, or how you handle the set of molecules in order to can of uh, molecules of hot air, right? right? The thing that studies is not big enough. So I put those molecules in the balloon, right? Yeah. And so, uh, so, so why do differential equations uh, and we call data analysis stuff. So uh, analysis of these of the shapes of uh, how these expression terms uh, compare them together, uh, searches in parameter spaces for a certain quantities uh, probability. But basically underlying thing is differential equations. Which are the same tools as uh in that session. Okay, well I think it'd be Thank you all for coming. <laughs>